So uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our next speaker who's going to talk to you about from big data to face data, Nikita Ivanov. He's actually one of the co-founders of GridGain and responsible for taking the uh, technology to enterprise back in 2005. So uh, Nikita. So uh, my name is Nikita Ivanov. I'm a, one of the founders of uh, GridGain Project, GridGain Systems, and what's known today as Apache Ignite Project. Um, so this conference is basically both uh, incredibly gratifying and, and amusing at the same time. It's, it's incredibly gratifying because it's a first in-memory computing uh, summit, surprisingly, as, as Abe mentioned before. It's really you know, amazing to have all these people from all these different vendors and competitors and customers and everybody else in the same room for the first time. And it's the same time I'm using that. It is the first time. Think about this. There was so much uh, interest and news and hype about our memory computing for the last, what, five, seven years. And this is the first, small, the first, but still the first industry-wide global, I think, in memory computing conference. It's pretty cool. So what I'm going to be talking in the next 45 minutes is we'll talk about what is in memory computing, why is it, you know, that it's so popular today. Uh, we'll talk a lot about facts and myths about a memory computing. I'll try to step down on kind of level of abstraction from Mike's talk and really give you a little bit more technical kind of overview of what it is. We'll talk about some use cases, what we see uh, where grid game project and Apache Ignite projects are being used today, obviously Q&As. So let's talk about subject, what is in memory computing and why? I've been doing this presentation for literally over almost a decade by now, and on this slide, or at the beginning of the presentation, I always want to talk about what is in memory computing. I give you all kinds of different definitions. You know, if you Google this, you know, you'll find plenty of definitions of what is in memory computing. Lately, I basically found that you know, no matter the definition I give you, you're going to have a little bit different perspective. So all of us instinctively understand what is in memory computing, right? You move data from disk of flash to RAM, and things go faster. The rest of it is really details. It's details of a product's approaches, techniques, and their paradigms, whatever you do. But fundamentally, in memory computing is all about moving data from slow media, like spinning disk, you know, um, magnetic devices, and flash, to DRAM. And that's practically it. Everything else, things go faster from this point on. So a lot more interesting question is about why, all of a sudden, we talk about in-memory computing in the last you know, five to seven years. Um, it's kind of an interesting question because all of us, and anybody who has any kind of you know, uh, computer science degree, we all know by definition that if we move things in RAM, things will go faster. Why we haven't been doing this for, you know, and we've known this for literally for maybe half a century, you know, for the first time of computers came around and the first, you know, tapes came around. Everybody knew the tapes were a lot slower than the RAM. From that point on in the mid-50s, we knew if you move things in RAM, things will go faster. What was the problem? Uh, there were several problems, but I think what's really, you know, kicked down in the last, again, five to seven years is this, this you know, um, the chart on the left that you guys saw a million times of a growth of a data. We have enormous growth of data. It's exponentially growing, as we know, and we constantly have to process more and more and more data. So therefore, the need for real-time processing is really dramatically ramped up. But I think one of the most fundamental changes that happened is the chart on your right, which is the cost, the economics behind a memory. Most of you all now remember, what was the price of, let's say, a terabyte cluster 15, 20 years ago? An astronomical. And only big companies and DODs and trillion agencies could afford that. If you look at this chart, the, I know you don't see much of it, but look at these two lines, thick and thin. The line on the bottom is the price of hard drives. It's basically steadily dropping year over year over year. And for all intents and purposes, for price of hard spinning disk today is free. The hard drives today are naturally free, if not entirely free, factually. The, right, the line on the top, the little bit more jagged line, is the line of price of DRAM per kilobyte. What's interesting, it's relatively more expensive still, but what's really interesting about this is that it's going down in exactly the same angle and trajectory as the price of hard disks, and it's dropping 30% year or year and a half over. And that's what really made an in-memory computing from esoteric technology to a, a market force literally about five or seven years ago when the economics finally reached the kind of pivot point. Everybody said, you know what? It's all of a sudden affordable. We can have two, three, five terabyte of RAM cluster for 
relatively small price. And that's what basically made almost everybody in the industry starting to look, pay attention to memory computing from big guys like Oracle, Microsoft, IBM, almost everybody to small startups like Gridgen and other companies. And there's a plenty of projects that you basically heard about, like WhatsApp sold to Facebook, an entirely in-memory platform. Like companies like Workday, I think they're present here, also very much an in-memory based technology and products. And there's a dozens and hundreds and hundreds of those. We see customers from all walks of life, not only from kind of, you know, trendy startups, but very boring customers like banks and insurance companies. Everybody jumping, everybody's jumping in this bandwagon. So in the next couple of slides, I want to give you a couple of, a couple of interesting thoughts about a memory computing. And that's kind of provoked to think about in many different directions. Some of you old enough to remember late 50s, 60s, you know, there was an era of tapes, right? If we're really old enough, you remember, you were storing things on tapes. Late 60s, early 70s, the real revolution happened. And the two things happened in the mid 70s. The, the nascent spinning disks become affordable with uh, IBM 340 system that just shipped, which we called the Winchester disk, right? What also happened in the same time frame, the SQL, structured query language finally won the you know, battle between every other standard and become really a standard for data processing for the generations to come, literally for the next 30, 40 years. So 70s was a really pivotal time. Went from a very slow tapes that took literally minutes and hours to get any data to a spinning disk. They were blazingly fast back then. And we got a new you know, design in our standard for a data processing, which was SQL. So for the next literally uh, 35, 40 years, that was the deal, right? We went through a myriad of uh, variations of the disk technology from faster to faster to faster. Eventually we got the flash, which is essentially just you know, a, you know, a temporary solution to the disk-based problem. It's still a block device, an external device. And what we have today, think about this. We have a similar shift, a paradigm shift, similar to the 70s. What happened? First, on the hardware side, we have in-memory revolution, where we're, becoming, where we're basically starting to treat RAM as, as the system of records for a lot of different applications. What else has happened, or happening, is the move from just structured data, SQL data, to a mix of unstructured and structured data. And lots of analysts will tell you that most of the growth would be in unstructured data. And that's a very much the same, I believe, pivotal point in our industry, much like 40 years ago, we on this point where we transition radically from one type of data storage to another, from a external disk-based device of flash to a DRAM-based. We transition from a mostly structured processing data processing to a mix of structured and, unpro and unstructured data. Gartner has this wonderful way of saying this. The RAM is new disk, disk is new tape. Think about this. RAM is new disk, disk is a new type. That's what's happening today. The last final thought on this slide I want to basically bring up is the even more probably controversial. I do fundamentally believe that in-memory storage of data, or in-memory computing more generally, is a really final frontier in the data storage. Now think about this. Since late 50s to this present day, we went through a variety of different storage technologies. Went from a tapes, external device, to a spinning disk, external device, then faster and faster and faster, and we went to the flash, which is still external device, and then we went to much closer to CPU, which is the main memory of computers, DRAM. Where else can we go? Think about this for a second. Where else? Lots of folks told me, well, what about CPU cache? Well, it's a very small, it's about three times faster. It doesn't really count. So if you think about this, storing data in RAM, obviously in distributed fashion, is the really final frontier for how we treat data storage. There's no else to go unless we fundamentally change the way we think about our computers. But in the way they're designed today, this is it. We're gonna get faster and faster RAM, that's true, but fundamentally there's no other change. There may be different types of RAM, we're talking about non-volatile RAM and whatnot, but still, still it's the same DDR3, DDR4 on your motherboard that we'll be storing you know, our data in. So it's a very provocative thought, thinking about this. In memory computing is not a stopgap solution. It's not just a basically temporary performance fix. It's about as final as it gets in the next, 
I don't know, half a century potentially, unless we move to something dramatically different, like a biocomputer and whatnot. In the current architecture of computers, this is pretty much it when it comes to data storage technology. This is an interesting idea. When we talk about in memory computing, we're not talking about completely eliminating disks. That's a wrong way to look at it. Most in memory computing systems today, and probably for foreseeable, foreseeable future, will have disks involved, surprisingly enough. When I talk about in memory computing, I always talk about memory first, disk second, versus the disk first architecture we've had for many, many years. Let me give you the contrast in the, in the difference here. For the last maybe 30, 40 years, we have what we call the disk first architecture, where with disk or predominant storage, spinning disk or flash were predominant a storage and memory used just for caching. Think about this, you store most of the data on the disk, on flash, doesn't matter, on external devices. And then you cache just a little bit in your RAM, most, you know, most frequently accessed, whatever policy you have. Just cache small data set right there. But the data, most of the bulk of the data, really resides in centralized database. Now think about this, what it involves, what it involves, involves the process of accessing this data on the disk. Let's say you're on an application. So what you need to do basically, your application makes the call, the call goes to operating system, the operating system contacts the, uh, some driver, the driver can, you know, literally makes a contact to a I.O. Uh, controller on the motherboard, and I.O. controller finally contacts the device, like you know, spinning disk or flash, and then all the way back. That's basically what it takes to access data from the application that resides in some kind of external device. It's a pretty long way, and add to this marshalling and demarshalling of this data from a byte stream to whatever object representation you have. When you compare this to the memory architecture and the memory first architecture where you keep bulk of the data in RAM and use disk only for the backup, in this architecture, if you want to read an object, from that store, about the only thing you do is a point or arithmetic. Think about this. If you were to have, you have, a, you know, if you have an external data store, you have all this long chain of events happening for every read you need to make. When you have a memory system, about the only chain of event you have is the one operation, the point or arithmetic. And that's actually, surprisingly enough, for a lot of applications, this is the reason that in memory is so fast. Not because memory as a medium is fast, of course it's faster. It's about a million times faster than a spinning disk. But sometimes this difference get, you know, get really clobbered in our applications. But one of the real difference why in-memory apps are so quick, or in-memory applications and computing so quick, is this difference. How do we access a piece of data? There's a long chain of events versus literally a, a nanosecond point arithmetic in our modern CPUs. That's the interesting difference. And latency is definitely, you know, when we talk about a databases or a disk-based storage, it took about milliseconds. When we talk about in-memory computing, latency is really in a nano or microseconds uh, range. Another interesting aspect of that is, and that's actually a very, very, very cool one, we don't talk about this idea uh, often enough, is bringing computation to your data. That has only relative only relative or only kind of, you know, um, adherence to memory computing. It can happen without a memory computing, but surprisingly enough, bringing computation to your data was one of the few things that the memory computing really brought up into the, into the fold. So what happened in the client-server architecture, in the, literally in the last, again, in the last 35 years? Well, our data was in centralized database, and we now have to process this data, right? We have to move it from database to our application servers, right? Once we process this, most of the time we keep it in cache or drop it out. That's a typical process. The problem with that is that if you, most of your data leaves in centralized database, there's no way to do the parallel processing. There's nothing to parallelize on. Your data is centralized place. It lives in one massive Oracle database, OSAP cluster, or just a few, few nodes. In memory computing, really changed that. By the way, Hadoop works the same way, and many other projects work the same way. Basically, when you keep when you, uh, when you keep uh, your data in memory, uh, you almost often keep it in a distributed fashion because the single computer doesn't really have enough RAM 
to store anything useful. Therefore, you end up basically with a cluster, with a distributed system. Once you have data partitioned across multiple computers, you can do very, very effective parallelized processing. And that's actually, surprisingly, it's a norm for in-memory computing. It's not something you have to do. You're actually forced in a certain way to do it because, again, a single computer can only hold as much RAM as, you know, only so much RAM in it. So most in-memory computing system distributed by nature, and therefore they prime for distribution parallelization. And that's the fundamental difference in how do we do it. So in-memory computing systems, you typically bring computations to your data not data to computation. It has tremendous ramification of performance and scalability in how system architected. I want to talk about some of the myth. You know, this is pretty cool stuff. And I've been, I've been you know, talking to customers for years and years and years, and there's quite a few things that actually pops up every goddamn meeting, and it's usually not true. So the first one is obviously this, this one. It's too expensive. I don't want to talk about it too much, but you know, a couple of years ago, I had a different slide on this, basically asking the audience, how much do you think the terabyte cluster costs today? To cut the story short, the terabyte cluster today, think about this, 10 blades, commodity Dell blades, a terabyte RAM total capacity, all the networking gear, all the hard disks, how much? Less than 20K. Think about this, a terabyte of DDR3 or potentially DDR4 next year, about 20K. Just to give you perspective, about four years ago, the entire working set of Twitter was about four terabytes. This is actually the old tweets for one week. They would keep. So with the price of less than new Tesla, you can buy today a, literally a, enough RAM to keep four-year-old Twitter working set in RAM. Have a microsecond, maybe millisecond response to any type of analytics on it. Think about this. This is the fundamental change in cost structure. You know, 10 years ago, you'll be looking at millions of dollars. And it's fairly expensive. Today, almost any recently funded startup in Silicon Valley can afford that or a lot more than this. And by the way, there is a plenty of new stuff coming up in terms of RAM. Uh, I mentioned a couple of themes like you know, MSC, like memory channel storage, storage class memory, but my, probably most, most important one is NVDMs, a non-volatile RAM. Uh, we're going to be working with Dell and Micron, and uh, we're trying to work, be one of the first a project and software that supports a non-volatile RAM. Think about this, normal DDR4 that is persistent. Pretty cool stuff. That's coming up. It's already available, by the way. It's available in small, in small capacitors. In the next year, it's going to be available in larger capacitors, and we're going to be one of the first ones, hopefully, to really support that on our project. Kind of naturally, so the myth number two, not durable. Again, not true. Uh, in memory systems, because of the nature of RAM, in memory systems, one of the most complex and sophisticated systems when it comes to durability and availability. There's literally endless amount of features that you know, projects like Ignite or Grid Gain or any other else support in this area. You can, data is completely distributed. You have multiple backups in the, in the clusters. You know, data can be stored on a disk, on a local flash storage. There's a plenty of ways to do a durability or ensure that your data is durable if your nodes crash. You know, some of the projects like you know, Enterprise version of grid gain system supports very complex data center applications. So you can have your in-memory data geographically replicated in a transactional, non-transactional, synchronous and synchronous way. Again, when it comes to in-memory computing, durability is not an issue. We, you know, any, you ask any vendor in memory computing, they have customers in a hardcore financial service organization, government organizations, where durability is absolutely must. It would not be used if not to have durability, and uh, in-memory computing is absolutely durable today. Flash is fast enough. We hear this quite a lot. For some application, that is true. Flash has grown up a lot, and for some apps, especially for those that just need to plug in this as you drive in a laptop, that's enough. You don't need the memory computing to speed up your word processor or email. Flash is good enough. But again, Flash is again just a block device. It's external device no matter what, PCIe Express cards, no matter what, Fusion, you know, violin, it is still an external device. You still have this a very massive uh, call out to the external devices. RAM is still dramatically faster. Look at this chart over here. So RAM is dramatically faster by at least several orders of magnitude, if not more, than a flash. So again, depending on application, 
If you just want to speed up your laptop or your iPhone typically or something like this, definitely SSD is a perfectly, perfectly way to go. If you need to really bring up milliseconds to microseconds or seconds to the microseconds in memory computing for a big data sets, that's about the only way today. We kind of, you know, uh, shifting a little bit. So only for caching. That's another basically interesting, you know, myth that when we talk to our customers, they basically saying, look, isn't memory computing only for caching? That's what we've been using, right? That's what database been using for years and years and years. And that's true. And, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, caching, which is the keeping in memory the most frequently used piece of data, was the only use case. And that's a perfectly used case even today. But in memory computing has grown up dramatically beyond that point. So in the last you know, 10 or 15 years, most of you probably followed, we had in memory data grids, in memory compute grids, in memory data fabrics, all of this you know, much more sophisticated in memory systems, where basically we're starting to treat in memory as a strategic data layer. And we now have transactional processing with fully asset properties. We have analytics on top of that, streaming on top of that, a file system on top of that. And we have a Spark list, we have a Hadoop accelerator, we have plenty of technologies basically that work on top of the in-memory computing idea. So caching is just one of them. As a matter of fact, in my opinion, is literally the least exciting because a lot of different apps already have caching. You know, if you have used an Oracle database, for example, or any database, they already have pretty sophisticated caching. There's almost no need to repeat that. If you're using memory computing just for caching, just a simple caching, you're probably missing a lot. Uh, of what happened in the memory computing in the last, you know, five to ten years. Uh, I can tell you from our experience in Great Gain, most of our customers do not use us for caching, quite literally. They use us for something dram dramatically more sophisticated than that. It's transactions, analytics, it's a Hadoop speedups, it's whatever. Caching would probably not even come as, as, a, as a requirement. It's it obviously there, you can cache it. But, you know, typical real-life use case is a lot more sophisticated than this. What I do believe in the future, is that, and when I say future, it could be next year, it could be next five years, or maybe happening today, is the future with memory computing really in what I call virtualized or plug and play products where you don't really have to spend time developing into it. Because most of the products today, whether it's in memory database, in memory data grid, in memory fabric, you still need to develop to it. You still need to write to APIs or use some SQL stuff or something like this. I do believe the future, and that's very complex. And that's why you know, you know, it takes certain time to adopt the memory computing. I do believe that the future would be in the plug and play products where you just start to use in memory as a kind of plug and play fashion, and all of a sudden your existing apps start working faster. We have, you know, a at grid game now, I put my grid game hat on me. We have pretty interesting technology with a memory file system and a memory Hadoop accelerator. And that's one of the directions where we're going with our own products and products where those things are completely plug and play. You don't have to do anything. Like for example, our Hadoop accelerator, you literally install this plug and play component along the side of Hadoop, and your Hadoop jobs works up to 30%, up to 30 times faster, I'm sorry. Think about this, zero code change, zero anything, zero data movement, zero nothing. Just install free product 30 times faster on some of the works in the Hadoop world. That's what I believe the future of in-memory computing would be is this plug and, play, plug and play capabilities to really get this speed going. So one of the last slides I have is, you know, we don't see this, uh, the, the header, but you know about use cases. I really want to talk about just a little bit about a different use cases that we see here, uh, from our perspective for grid gain, and we'll give you a good idea where actually this stuff is used. I'm almost sure that for any other vendors or any other projects, it will be pretty much the same story. So it's not going to be specific to us. Financial service applications, probably a, a default use case. That's where it's all started 20, 25, 30 years ago. Financial service companies, those in the Wall Street, were the, one of the first users of the memory computing. Pretty natural. For all of them, speed means money, quite literally. And they've been trying to find a ways to do the automated trading, the algo trading, the risk analysis, repricing, you know, back testing, all these different you know, use cases. And they've been doing this on the memory computing for probably the last 20, 25 years. Uh, they're one of the most sophisticated users. Again, in memory computing on the Wall Street is almost everywhere. 
I mean, literally almost everywhere. You cannot find a use case where there's not a vendor or an app built with this technology. Because again, for a 24 hour trading, you know, literally 365 days ac across the year, there's no way to sustain the global trading uh, volumes without, you know, if you touch the disk, you're basically behind already. So um, those are big customers. And you know, if you listen to me in my presentation, you know, 10 years ago about this, that would be about the only customer group we would have, quite literally. Financial services would be about the only one. Today we have actually a very interesting and diverse group of people who are actually using memory computing. Uh, hybrid or lap OTP systems, that's a very new thing, but it's happening you know, literally on a weekly basis. We have a weekly conversation with potential customers and users who try to basically combine analytical and transactional processing into one system to really, like Mike mentioned in the previous presentation, to really remove this gap of a data at rest. You know, uh, why can't we run analytics and not transactional data? Before that, we couldn't because there was a performance penalty. But with memory computing, we potentially may overcome that. That's a very interesting use case. Online and mobile advertisement and games. Quite a few, uh, there's a quite a few Sony uh, big play uh, titles that use actually uh, Ignite projects in the back end. Again, it's a very interesting use case. Uh, as you probably a lot of player gamers here, if you play the game, the games usually go like this and there's a huge drop and then there's a mutation curve. And uh, most of the games developers trying to figure out how to serve those millions of users playing the game simultaneously. Very interesting use case. Um, another interesting use case I want to mention about a minute I have left is a SaaS enablement. And again, it's a very horizontal, but it's a very interesting use case. We've seen it literally throughout all types of industry where a company is moving from kind of centralized apps to a SaaS model. And think about it, what happens when you do that? On the, on the kind of strategic level. All of a sudden, you have the same amount of resources, but dramatically more users hitting your app. You have you know, multi-tenancy, you have the, you know, multiple users hitting the same data sets, all kinds of problems. And even surprisingly to us, you know, when we start seeing this trend about two or three years ago, surprising to us, in-memory computing is almost ideal fit to it, because you can utilize the RAM on your computers to really gain tremendous performance and really build those SaaS applications without ripping up power of your in existing infrastructure and really reuse your current infrastructure almost sometimes to the point of reusing it one-to-one -one and be able to serve a lot more users in parallel on the same infrastructure. So this is my, I think this is my last slide. If you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you. <laughs>